The 20th century saw dramatic changes in moral behavior, especially in what are known as Western nations, principally Europe, and the English-speaking world of Canada, the United States, Australia, and New Zealand. To a great degree, this was a result of the Darwinian view that we are the product of blind chance rather than supernatural intelligence. The atrocities of World War II also caused people to question whether such carnage could happen in the presence of a loving God. Penicillin and the pill played a part in freeing people from two of the greatest fears of intimacy outside of marriage, pregnancy and disease. Only the perception changed, not the problems. Premarital pregnancies still happen at an alarming rate, and STDs are ever-present, debilitating, and deadly. Then there were the intellectuals, the secular evangelists of the new morality. Freud, Kinsey, William Masters and Virginia Johnson, Edward Brecker, and others. They aimed to liberate us from our repressive Victorian past. Regardless of the cause, the effects have been dramatic. Few aspects of life have undergone more change in both perception and behavior than the institution of marriage. Behaviors that were once shameful are now considered normal. Isn't it time that we ask, is the direction we chose working? Has our new morality, or better yet, our lack of morality, left us better or worse? Is it not time to reevaluate? Today on Tomorrow's World, I'm asking and answering the question, does marriage matter? So don't go away because I'll be right back to answer that question with the facts. Welcome to Tomorrow's World, where today we will explore the question, does marriage matter? This is no trivial question because I guarantee that every one of you watching this program is touched by the answer. There was a dramatic shift away from moral values in the last century. A majority of people in professing Christian nations in America, Europe, and elsewhere once had a certain consciousness of God. Both Christians and Jews look to some degree to the Bible and especially the Ten Commandments as the guiding light for behavior. Those rules tempered raw human behavior. But during the second half of the 20th century, belief in God and morality in these nations declined rapidly. The philosophy of secular humanism replaced the Ten Commandments in courts and educational institutions. Secular humanism expresses the view that humans can be ethical and moral without religion or God. The result is that for many, long-held standards of morality have been retired to the dustbins of history. Regarding views on marriage, the Toronto Star describes a new paradigm. Traditional values are almost frowned upon among young singles in downtown Toronto where a certain sex and the city casualness remains an ideal. I think that there's this new shame to saying you want to get married, like it's not cool or something. In the introduction for today's program, I ask these questions. Is the direction we chose working? Has our new morality, or better yet, our lack of morality, left us better or worse? And is it not time to reevaluate? What are the facts? Where has human reason led us? Let's look at three consequences of society's self-reasoned new outlook on marriage. Consequence number one is, the new morality is bad for relationships. This point is interesting because human reason and common perception don't match the facts. Human reason says it is good to test someone prior to marriage whether he or she is compatible with you, as one would test drive an automobile before purchasing it. The United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reports this finding in a 2016 National Health Statistics report. 
In 2011 to 2013, 60% of women and 67% of men agreed living together before marriage may help prevent divorce. This is what the majority of people think, but what are the facts? Jay Teachman of Western Washington University, one of the most robust predictors of marital disillusion that has appeared in the literature is premarital cohabitation. Marriages preceded by a spell of cohabitation are as much as 50% more likely to end in divorce at any marital duration than marriages not preceded by cohabitation. This is not what researchers expected to find, and that makes the findings even more impressive. Many studies are conducted to prove a point of view, but when the facts are different and are still reported honestly, you have a worthwhile study. Here's what they expected to find. Early investigators expressed surprise at this result because it had sometimes been theorized that premarital cohabitation would act as a screening device. The co-director of the National Marriage Project, David Popino of Rutgers University, confirms in an article titled, The Top Ten Myths of Marriage, that human reason and facts don't always match. Many studies have found that those who lived together before marriage have less satisfying marriages and a considerably higher chance of eventually breaking up. One reason is that people who cohabit may be more skittish of commitment and more likely to call it quits when problems arise. But in addition, the very act of living together may lead to attitudes that make happy marriages more difficult. Study after study shows that sleeping together prior to marriage has a poor track record. That's our first reason why marriage matters. And I'll be back with another reason after a short break to tell you about today's free offer, God's Plan for Happy Marriage. Whether you're married or single, you need this resource. All you have to do is call the toll-free number that will be given to you momentarily and ask for today's offer. Just ask for the marriage booklet, or you can obtain or download a copy free of charge by going to our website. And I'll be right back with more evidence that marriage matters. So don't go away. Let me tell you how you can receive your free copy. Call the number displayed on the screen and ask for God's plan for happy marriage. You can also order online at twcanada.org. We're happy to send this to you at no cost. Marriage is one of God's greatest gifts, and yet so many today are failing. Why? There really are keys that can make or break a marriage. You need to know. Don't wait. Call now or visit us online to get your free copy. If you missed our contact information, don't worry, I'll be back to give it again later. On today's edition of Tomorrow's World, I'm asking the question, does marriage matter? In the previous segment, we looked at one consequence of human reason when it comes to how we conduct ourselves prior to marriage. Consequence number one was, the new morality is bad for relationships. Now let's look at another reason why marriage matters. Number two is that the new morality is bad for children. Unplanned pregnancies are common within marriage. How many of us were accidents? In marriage, even where an unplanned and unwanted pregnancy occurs, there is a mother and a father to love and care for the child. But a child coming into the world outside of a stable parental relationship is a very different matter. The dynamics are not the same. According to Time Magazine Online, in a story by Amy Sullivan titled, Behind the Boom in Adult Single Motherhood, the group with the highest rate of unplanned pregnancies among single women is not teens, as many suppose. It's single women in their 20s. And 70% of pregnancies to these 20-somethings were unplanned. Now this creates a problem. Many women choose to abort their problem, but this may create long-standing psychological issues not anticipated. But what about those who give birth? What are the consequences for both mother and child? 
Quoting Ms. Sullivan again in the Time article, study after study has shown that babies born to unmarried mothers are at higher risk of ending up in poverty and that mothers themselves face educational and economic hurdles. And then what about the three in 10 single women in their 20s who actually plan to have a child out of wedlock? Many excuses are given as to why so many are choosing babies before commitment. And one such excuse is that of poverty. Men can't afford to raise a family. Is this valid reasoning? Advice columnist Emily Yoff writing under the name of Prudence for Slate, a liberal online U.S. magazine, wrote the following in response to this argument. Scholar Kay Heimowitz turns the argument around and says it's not that harsh economic conditions lead to women having children without fathers, but that the decision to have children without fathers leads to harsh and self-perpetuating economic conditions. She explains that having the belief that a solid marriage is central to one's life, that it precedes starting a family, encourages women and men to make important choices based on self-discipline and deliberation. This is a formula needed for upward mobility, qualities all the more important in a tough new knowledge economy. Ms. Yof describes the current single parent scene in America as a national catastrophe. While she promotes the importance of marriage and family, readers respond with a variety of excuses such as, having a child will be stressful and life-altering enough. Parents need to work on their relationship on their time schedule. I feel that a baby is its own blessing. Have that blessing before you get married. And how dare you imply that an unexpected pregnancy should lead to marriage. Note that all these excuses are emotionally, not factually based. When Ms. Yof is confronted with the accusation, you are simply out of touch with modern culture, she replies, that may be, but it also means that modern culture is out of touch with the needs of children. Some researchers identify out of wedlock births as the chief cause for the increasing stratification and inequality of American life the first step that casts children into an ever more rigid caste system. Studies have found that children born to single mothers are vastly more likely to be poor, have behavioral and psychological problems, drop out of high school, and themselves go on to have out-of-wedlock children. In today's postmodern world, facts don't seem to matter. We now live at a time when the forces of emotion, personal opinion, self-expression, and the mantra, your truth may not be my truth, prevail. But truth is not fluid. Either something is true and can be backed by facts or it can't. Note this study. For 10 years, the Fragile Families and Child Well-Being study at Princeton University has followed the families of 5,000 children, three quarters born to unwed parents. According to the research, most of these parents, both women and men, said they wanted to get married and to each other. But they somehow feel this mutual decision is beyond their power to make. And by not making it, the forces of inertia start pulling them apart. Five years after their children's births, only 16% of the couples had married and 60% had split. So far, we've seen that the new morality is not good for relationships or children. After a 30-second break, I'll give you a third consequence of our humanly devised approach to morality. But I want to remind you of today's free offer, God's Plan for Happy Marriage. If you're married, why not learn how to make your marriage even better? And if you're unmarried, discover the secrets that may increase your odds of forming a marriage relationship. God's plan for happy marriage is yours, free for the asking. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call, or go to our website. I'll be right back to show you our third and final consequence of humanly devised morality, so don't go away. To request your free copy, 
call the number displayed on the screen and ask for God's plan for happy marriage. You can also order online at TWCanada.org. Have you ever wondered why morality is under attack? Is the Bible still relevant? Or what does God expect of me? Tomorrow's World Magazine examines these important questions and more. It will also be sent to you free of charge. Call us right now or visit us online to get your free copy of God's Plan for Happy Marriage and Tomorrow's World Magazine. Enjoy the rest of today's program. So far we've seen that moral choices do matter. They matter for relationships and to children. One could make a long list of negative consequences for choosing reason over revelation. Historians and social workers know that the breakup of families has a disastrous effect on the fabric of nations. But in this segment of our program, I'm going to focus on one indisputable negative consequence that ought to be evident to all, the spread of deadly and life debilitating diseases. Consequence number three, the new morality is bad for your health. Even though 2008 sounds like ancient history to most teens, little has changed since this shocking headline from the Center for Disease Control appeared in newspapers across America. CDC, at least one in four teenage girls has sexually transmitted disease. Here in Canada, several STIs, that's sexually transmitted infections, are on the rise. A report published by the Government of Canada echoes what we have been talking about today, that new attitudes of morality are a primary culprit for this increase. The causes for these increases are complex and include changing sexual attitudes and social contexts related to risky behavior as well as the use of recreational drugs that decrease inhibitions and impair decision-making during sexual activity. The health benefits of marriage go beyond the obvious risk of STDs and STIs. While the potential for partner abuse is often viewed as a downside to marriage, an article published by the University of Toronto shows, women who are married suffer less partner abuse substance abuse or postpartum depression around the time of pregnancy than women who are cohabiting or do not have a partner, says a University of Toronto researcher. So what is the answer? The answer is that marriage matters when considering the most intimate of human relations, and there are invisible laws at work that make for success or failure. The sexual revolution what is often referred to as the new morality, really took off in the 1960s. It's not that everyone was free from acting as alley cats prior to this time. Far from it. But the 60s saw a dramatic change in Western attitudes. Edward M. Brecker wrote the following in 1969. Here, I think, is a task for sex research, an objective inquiry into the short term and long-term effects on men, women, and children of emancipation from sexual repression, from feeling of sexual shame and guilt. This quote is found in Wendy Shalit's A Return to Modesty. Ms. Shalit responds to this statement with the following, So welcome, Mr. Brecker, to the world of postmodern sexual morality. In some respects, it has turned out more horrifying than even the inhibited might have imagined. The question, I guess, then becomes, is our guerrilla etiquette as good as the older rules? On today's program, we've examined the results of abandoning these older rules. The new morality is bad for relationships. The new morality is bad for children and the new morality is bad for your health. The first two human beings were given instruction from an intelligent being far greater than them. That intelligent being knew all about chemistry, biology, anatomy, and invisible laws that when kept produce good results, but when broken bring pain, sorrow, and even death. This being understood these things because he was their creator. He gave our first parents a choice, 
they could accept revealed knowledge that would enlighten them regarding these invisible laws, or they could choose for themselves the prerogative to determine right and wrong. They put their trust in their five senses and in their ability to reason, and they chose poorly. What are the results of their experiment? The results are all around us. Conflict between peoples and nations, broken families, divorce, disease, and suffering of every kind. The God of the Bible is not vague when it comes to intimate relationships. The Bible makes it clear that God created us for intimacy. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Take careful note that there was no shame at this point, but that would soon change. After they made the decision to trust their own reasoning, they saw themselves differently. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. That's chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. Now, here's a critical point most people read right over. Notice verse 11. And he, that is God, said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? It was only after our parents rejected revelation and chose their own way that they saw their bodies in a bad light. Yes, there is a spirit power that messes up the most intimate relationship between men and women, but it's not our Creator. The Bible tells us that full intimacy within marriage is good and proper. Marriage is an institution to be honored, but notice the difference between the married and the unmarried states. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. The foundation of biblical law is love as expressed by the Ten Commandments. One of the commandments is, you shall not commit adultery. The Apostle Paul also counsels us to avoid sexual immorality because it brings about painful penalties. Notice this in 1 Corinthians the 6th chapter and verse 18. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Now, in spite of these clear instructions and admonitions, the most intimate of all human relations is too often shared outside of marriage. Our experiment in human reason has gone on way too long. The evidence is in. If we have eyes to see, we must conclude that the God of the Bible knows better than we do. We must conclude that marriage does matter. Here at Tomorrow's World, we're not so naive as to think that we have the ability to change anyone's behavior, but we do believe that we can present the truth of the Bible along with factual information from which individuals can choose. For those who have eyes to see and ears to hear, the results of human behavior are obvious. Disobedience to God's laws brings pain and suffering. Obedience to His laws brings comfort to life. Now, if you want to learn more about the invisible laws governing marriage, be sure to order your free copy of God's Plan for Happy Marriage. And stay tuned after the program for Tomorrow's World Answers, where we answer your questions straight from the Bible. And be sure to come back next week as Stuart Wahovich, Michael Haycoop, and I give you the good news of tomorrow's world. To learn more about today's topic, visit TWCanada.org. You can also order by calling us at 1-866-784-7895 or by writing to us at Tomorrow's World, P.O. Box 409, Mississauga, Ontario, L5M 0P6. You will also receive a free subscription to Tomorrow's World magazine, revealing God's principles for leading an abundant and happy life while providing insight into current and future events. Welcome to Tomorrow's World Answers. 
Many are familiar with the biblical command that a wife must have respect for her husband. What instruction does the Bible give concerning how a husband is to treat his wife? Over the centuries, many cultures have arisen in which wives have not always been treated with the respect and honor they were to show to their husbands. This has led to many sad relationships and in some cases tragedy where wives have been badly treated and have not been viewed as making a contribution of equal value to the husband in the marriage. Even some large religions have fostered the view that wives are of lesser value than their husbands. What does the Bible actually teach? It is interesting that in giving the fifth commandment, children were to give honor equally to their fathers and mothers. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. In ancient and even some contemporary societies, marriages were arranged. This occurred even in biblical times. Yet in the scriptural record, we see women respected enough that the prospective bride was given a choice. We can see an example of this in a marriage being arranged for Isaac, the son of Abraham, to a young woman named Rebekah. Then they said, let's call the girl and ask her about it. So they called Rebekah and asked her, will you go with this man? I will go, she said. God clearly expects a husband and a wife to behave with the utmost loyalty and kindness toward each other. God despises it when a man is unfaithful to his wife, flirting or carrying on with another woman. You ask, why? It is because the Lord is acting as witness between you and the wife of your youth, because you have broken faith with her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. Not only were husbands instructed to remain faithful to their wives, they are also instructed to love them to the greatest degree imaginable in the same manner that Jesus Christ loves us. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. While some try to argue that the value of a woman is degraded in scripture, husbands in the New Testament church are clearly taught to show kindness, love, and respect to their wives, and they will do so if they truly desire to be called Christian. To submit a question for the show, email us at twanswers at tomorrowsworld.org. Be sure to watch us online at twcanada.org or by searching Tomorrow's World Answers on YouTube. At our website, you can also watch this and many more Tomorrow's World programs. Call 1-866-784-7895, write or visit us online today. This program is a production of The Living Church of God.